Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my pleasure to welcome John uh, for an interview here with MCRC. John has been really prolific at UW. He's published lots of papers. He's gotten tons of awards. I had to write them on my phone just so that I remember, including the Microsoft Research Fellowship, the best paper nomination at UBCOM, best paper at CHI, and the, most recently, the University of Washington College of Engineering uh, Student of the Year. It's the Innovator of the Year, right? And his technology has been licensed to Belkin as well. He's been doing a lot of practical stuff. And that's what he'll talk to us today about. That's right. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, so uh, really, the focus of my dissertation work has been on environmental behaviors. And uh, so that's what I'll be talking about largely today. Uh, there's often kind of a profound disconnect between our everyday behaviors in the world and the effect that those behaviors can have on us, our health, or the environment around us. So there's been two main parts of my dissertation on transit and on uh, home resource consumption. So those are really going to be the focus of my talk today. So I thought I would start out with some relatively startling statistics about consumption. So in the United States, we proudly consume 346 million gallons of gas per day, which that might actually seem like a lot, and it is. It's more than twice the amount of Japan, China, Canada, Russia, and Germany combined. Um, and this accounts for about 26% of our carbon emission footprint. So there's also some sort of other kind of environmental consequences. Um, these problems really are only becoming more significant with growing population, economic development across the world. So, for example, in Beijing, they have their water consumption, which rose to nearly one trillion gallons of water. Uh, but the main problem here is that their water supply infrastructure only supplies about 576 billion gallons of water. So there's a big um, a difference there, obviously. And so the Beijing government has gone and started melting snow to provide fresh water to the citizens. They also import fresh water by tanker ships. So they're going to unprecedented lengths to provide uh, this scarce resource to their citizens. And these sorts of problems don't just affect international cities, but also here in America, really all along the Colorado River Basin. For example, Lake Mead, which supplies 90% of Las Vegas's fresh water, the, uh, the intake pipes, uh, the water levels are supposed to go below the intake pipes in the next five years. So these are big, big problems, right? And because of that, they require multifaceted solutions that incorporate economic, political, behavioral, and technological solutions. And I've really been focused on these latter two areas here, so behavioral and technological. And it's really no coincidence that I selected the Toyota Prius to represent technological innovation because they also have a behavioral component as well. So, and that is in terms of their Prius interface, which you may have seen if you've ever been in a Prius. It gives you instant feedback about your driving performance, and this has really led to a movement of hypermilers. So people are able to gain efficiency out of their vehicle simply by focusing on the feedback that the car is giving them. And this is an example of eco-feedback, which has been largely the focus of my dissertation work. And these systems have three components, you, some kind of sensing system, and some kind of feedback system. And I'll come back to this diagram later in my talk. So what about sensing and feedback in the home? Well, ordinarily, if we think about electricity, we have to go outside of the home right, to see this electricity meter. That, that gives us real-time information on consumption. But even then, even if we were able to look at the meter, it's really in esoteric units that don't make much sense, so kilowatts per hour. Um, another way that we get access to this information is through a traditional bill, but this is temporally disconnected. right? So these arrive about a month or bi-monthly, so they're temporally disconnected from the consumption activity. Interestingly, there's a startup company called Opower, which has been tremendously successful. They're taking the same data that energy utilities have access to, all energy utilities, and they're just reframing it, right? So revisualizing it in the bills, and they've been successful. In fact, 2.5% savings just amongst their constituencies who are getting this reframing of data, this revisualization of data. And this accounts for about 20 million tons of coal or the yearly output of four nuclear power plants. So these are significant, and just by simply changing the way that the information is rendered to the people, the, the home occupants. So can we do better than paper? Well, I think we can. This is actually a tremendous opportunity now. We have a plethora of different kinds of displays from iPads and iPods or Windows Phone 7 devices, um, all the way to in the home where we're starting to see smart thermostats and different kinds of ambient displays. But not only that, not only from the display standpoint, but also from the sensing and inference standpoint, right? So we're starting to see sensing and inference allow us to get access to different kinds of human behaviors and data about different kinds of human behaviors. 
So returning now to this diagram, there's really four underlying questions here. So there's two that are embedded in sensing what behavior should we sense and how. And for feedback, how should we present this data back to you? There's a giant design space here. And then finally, what impact does this feedback have on your behavior? So that was the intro of my talk. Uh, the next part of my talk is going to be on a design space, which really provides kind of a framework for thinking about how we might want to build these different kinds of feedback visualizations on environmental behaviors. And then I'm going to go through two concrete systems. The first is UB Green, which is a system for um, transit behaviors. And the second is all about water consumption in the home. So HydroSense is a water consumption sensor in the home. And then Reflect is a way of presenting that information back to home occupants. And then finally, I'll finish with future work. So let's take a look at this design space. Um, really there's been a number of interesting kinds of ways of rendering consumption information that have come out of design, HCI, UBCOMP communities in the last five to ten years. This one, for example, uh, this power aware cord pulsates and lights up depending on the amount of consumption that the device or appliance that's plugged into it draws. Microsoft Ohms, there's been a number of industrial players, Google Power Meter, Microsoft Ohm, where they have websites where you can get access to your electricity consumption information. Uh, here we have the energy detective, and notice th this is a real-time display. Notice they use monetary units here in addition to kilowatts per hour. So there's a number of different ways that we could really think about and brainstorm around rendering this kind of information to you, right? Um, what's interesting is when I started to really do some critical literature searches, I found that uh, the first display came out in the 1970s. And coincidentally, actually, this proudly came from the University of Washington, Kohlenbarg. And basically what they did was they instrumented a light bulb. They, they specially designed a light bulb which would illuminate when home occupants were within 90% of their peak energy levels. And they found that this was enough, this simple light bulb was enough to change people's energy behaviors in the home. So I think that really gives rise to two kind of questions. What makes an eco-feedback design system effective, right? From a light bulb all the way to these more rich kind of displays that we're seeing. And finally, uh, and the second one is how can we better understand the trade-offs, constraints, and different kinds of motivational strategies that we use in these eco-feedback designs. <clears throat> so to sort of get at these two questions, I conducted a very large literature search. And I didn't just target this literature search in HCI and UBCOMP, but I also extended beyond that and looked in environmental psychology, behavioral psychology, and some of the health behavior literature about how we can affect behavior through information. So let's return to this, uh, this eco-feedback design space. There's really two points to this. The first is a critical lens for us to evaluate and, and analyze existing systems. And the second is a design framework to allow designers to approach something principally and think about the trade-offs that they're making when they make these designs, because it's a giant design space. So there's nine points here, and each one of these points has a number of sub-dimensions. <clears throat> so I'll go through them briefly. So inputs. How do we get access to the data? How does the feedback system get access to the data? What does it look like? How often? What's the sampling resolution? Is there any kind of self-report? The next three, data representation, information access, and display medium. <clears throat> Basically, how is the data presented? And then the next five, I think, are really pretty much the most interesting, which kind of relate to what are the persuasive strategies that are used to kind of present a, uh, a a look at the data to provoke or promote certain kind of behaviors. So these are comparison, actability, motivational strategies, social and behavioral models. So let's use this. Let's return now to the Toyota Prius display and ask, why is the Toyota Prius display effective? And then let's use that design space and sort of situate that when we, when we ask this question. So I think there's a number of reasons, right? When you're driving, <clears throat> it's a constrained activity, right? So you're focused on the driving activity and you're getting information about that from the Toyota Prius display. It's also real time. So you're getting real time information about the driving, driving behavior. But I think what's most interesting perhaps is comparison, which has been found in psychology to be particularly motivating for certain behaviors. And they do this comparison in a number of different ways. So for, uh, to, they, they basically allow you to compare yourself to past performance, right? So here you have a current mileage, the instantaneous mileage that you're gaining out of the car, but it also allows you to compare that, to sort of ground it. Is that good or not? Yep. Um, are there longitudinal studies of this Prius effect, or right. are you just taking that as a... I mean, I, this I is, wonder like, if a month or two the, the novelty wears off. Right. So this is somewhat anecdotal, but the University of California has a large study now that's NSF commissioned to, to actually explore this in a longitudinal fashion. And you've seen a number of other car manufacturers adopt these same kind of strategies. So there is evidence that it, it you know, uh, that it's... Uh, 
option doesn't mean much, right? Like customers loving it right for the first two months is enough for them to sell cars, but that doesn't mean it has long-term impact. Right. So that's, I think that's that's sort of uh, currently up for argument, so that's why it's currently being studied. Uh, I would argue if you've ever ridden in a Toyota Prius or you've talked to uh, Toyota Prius drivers as I have, that a lot of them say that it's actually affected their behavior. So I can give you one anecdote uh, personally from my sister. She has a Toyota Prius. She was actually competing, which I'll get into in, actually, in, in a second, with her spouse. So they, by, by presenting the kind of instantaneous mileage information, she was able to have a little competition with her spouse in the car. And it was something that led her to drive more uh, performant as a result. So we can come back to that towards the end of my talk if you'd like. It's a good question. So in this case, it allows you to, to compare your instantaneous mileage along with the last 30 minutes, right? To ground how well that, that, that mileage is, as well as to, to the historic average. So in this case, it's 51.4 miles to, to the gallon. So in this way, sort of this design space allows you to analyze these existing systems, as I mentioned, but it also serves as a design framework to think about how we can improve these systems. So here, you can imagine comparing yourself to others. So just kind of the example that I gave you. So the car could actually assist with comparing your driving performance to other people's driving performance in the car to give you an idea of if you're a performant driver or not. Or it could compare you with somebody in the cloud. Another way could be comparing to a goal. So this could be tailored to your kind of driving behavior. The car could tailor that, or you could set it yourself. So there's just two examples about how you might improve this, this interface through the design space. So that was a quick run through of the eco-feedback design space and sort of how it allows us to think critically about designing these interfaces, and I'll interweave it throughout the rest of my talk. So now I want to turn towards a concrete system called UbiGreen. And UB Green is focused on looking at different kinds of transit patterns, so commuting patterns, and increasing awareness of people's uh, transit habits and attempting to motivate green transit behaviors. So there's really three questions here. What transit behaviors should we sense? How can we sense these transit behaviors? And how should this data be fed back to the user? So those are the three kind of questions. And I'm going to go through this part relatively quickly. But in terms of what to sense, we are primarily interested in commuting behaviors. So here we're looking at things like biking, walking, taking the bus, riding the train, and driving. And driving, it wasn't just driving alone. It was also driving with other people, which is the green activity. Driving alone is something that we wanted to dissuade. So how can we sense these transit activities? Well, at the time, I was actually working at uh, Intel, and they were working on this mobile sensing platform. Some of you actually might be familiar with it. Basically, it's a multimodal sensor board, and you wear it along uh, the belt, and it sends data, transmits confidence intervals to a computational unit, in this case, a phone. So it's basically running. It has its own computational unit here, as well as all of these sensors, and it's sending, doing some computations, sending those estimates through Bluetooth to a computational unit, and um, <clears throat> at the time, we knew that, or we figured that, this external sensor board would actually be migrating down into commodity phones itself. So something that Scott and I looked at in graduate school was taking the same kind of thing which required external sensors and just running it on the iPhone with the accelerometer within the iPhone. So there's clearly sort of advancements that, that have existed here since we started working on this, uh, this system. So that's how we got walking and biking, bicycling from this mobile sensing platform. But remember, we're also interested in taking the train, carpool, bus, and driving alone. And for this, we used GSM-based cell tower algorithms to sort of infer when people were in vehicles. And then we also had a little bit of self-report, which would ask you if you're with another person, since we couldn't automatically derive that information. So how should we visualize this data in an eco-feedback display? So this is the display itself, and it's unlike a normal iPhone application, you know, where you pull it out and you click on an icon and it launches. This is always running, and it's always running in the background, right? So there's basically this kind of pre-attentive awareness that this, uh, this mobile phone display is always available. And uh, as you might, you know, take to pull the phone out to make a phone call or to send a text message, you're going to see this background change. And it's broken down into a few ways. So the, the first thing is it shows you what your current activity is, your currently inferred activity. Then there's this animated uh, evolving image that changes depending on what your green actions are like. And then finally, there's this value icon bar that emphasizes secondary values that are associated with that transit activity. So here we're emphasizing sort of saving money and exercise, so two benefits of walking. So let's take a look at an animation of this over the course of a week. It starts on Sunday. The tree is relatively bare. And as people engage in green transit, this mobile phone adapts and changes the display. The flowers <clears throat> sort of levels up into this flower mode. And then eventually, the flowers bloom into, yep. Make sure you're not draining the battery. 
That's a good question. Uh, we didn't actually look at that in this particular case. Were you able to actually sense 24-7? Uh, it was about 11 hours of the day. Okay. So and the phone would actually tell them in, the, the phone was smart enough to tell people about charging behaviors, to remind them to charge at the, in the evening, as well as if they were leaving without wearing the device, as you might imagine happens from time to time, the phone would remind them to, take, to, to put it on if, they were, you know, if it was disconnected. So those are good questions. So then it would stay on this display until Sunday, in which the display would reset and all of our participants would get very disappointed. So uh, in addition to this tree-like display, we also had uh, a polar bear display, and here it's basically similar metaphors just in this kind of arctic ecosystem where the ice flow gets longer depending on um, the green activities that people are, are uh, conducting. So now I want to bring back this design space and just sort of tell you and explain how it was useful in designing the system and thinking about and evaluating the system. So data representation. We clearly took a much more artistic uh, approach here. But you can imagine a system that's like a time series graph, right? Or something that's a bar graph, something that's much more quantitative. But we took a more artistic approach. The visual complexity was relatively simple, but it's not something that you could immediately understand. You basically either needed to be taught it or learn it as you use it. The primary encoding was graphical. In fact, we didn't use any text. The measurement unit was the activity itself, and the view was categorical. A second part that we really emphasized was how is the information accessed, right? And this was through that background of the display. And here I'll just simply say that the update frequency was in real time, which is critically important for these kinds of displays. And it was co-located with the activity that you were engaged in, right? So you're getting information on the activity that you're currently engaged in. For the last part that I want to touch on, which I think is one of the most interesting and almost deserves an entire talk on its own, is motivational strategies. So here there's things like <clears throat> that, that come from behavioral psychology and persuasive technology, but things like just writing down uh, a commitment to something makes, it basically means that you're much more likely to engage in that kind of activity. So let me give you another kind of example about descriptive norms. So I've been traveling a lot, and descriptive norms are basically the idea that you know, seven out of 10 people do this. So you're in a circumstance in which you're unaware of what the normal action is, and you see information, and that could be very convincing for activity. So uh, there's a famous study about this with to hotel uh, towel hangers. You probably have seen these in your hotels. So uh, they basically try to advise you about hanging up your towel to save water, right, and to save laundry detergents so they actually don't wash the towel itself. So uh, Cialdini and Goldstein did a famous study where they used a standard environmental message on these little tower hangers. And they used a descriptive norm message. So here it says almost 75% of guests who are asked to participate in our new resource savings program do so. So which do you think resulted in more towel hanging in, in these rooms? The standard message or the descriptive norm message? Right. So there was a 26% increase here. And the critical part is it's just a change in language. It's just a change in the way that the information is presented to people. And it can have profound effects. So there, obviously, I think there's really a role for technology to do the same kind of thing, to encode those kind of behavioral economics or behavioral psychology findings into the displays themselves. In this case, we used a lot of stuff from game design. So we used things like rewards, a sense of narrative, a high degree of evocativeness. And we also used levels. So people got a sense of progress throughout the week as they were engaged in green transit. So to study this, we did a qualitative study over three weeks with 13 participants in Pittsburgh and in Seattle. And basically, we were interested in just investigating the sensing system, looking at the visual display, how do people react to it, how do people react to the sense of actually you know, being tracked, if you will, by the system, and then evaluate the potential to influence behavior. So this is what it looked like as a participant. You'd have the, the mobile phone, and you'd have the mobile sensing platform, and they'd be communicating constantly. So this is a research website that we had that only the researchers could access. So this was not for the participants, but this gives you a sense of what our, uh, the backgrounds of the mobile phones looked like. So this is on a Monday early in the week, and this is on a Saturday. So people were able to get at different levels throughout the week, and some people even got to the final level. So here we have flowers in the, uh, or fruit in the northern lights. So in all, we collected 8 million sensor events. We were basically logging everything on these phones. And 1,000 travel events. 72% were green. I'm going to really focus on the qualitative results since it was a qualitative study. So in terms of accessing the information, people really liked the fact that it was nearly omnipresent. It was very easy to get access to this information. 
in terms of the data representation, they liked this kind of artistic, abstract representation. They liked how the stories or these narratives were used. And in fact, a number of participants responded about wanting news stories every week. So being able to download news stories or being able to share news stories so that their phone would change stories from week to week. But the biggest thing that came up was the need for more quantitative data. So as it turns out, by creating all these kind of beautiful abstractions, it actually reduced the amount of information that people could derive. So they wanted the ability to compare their performance from week to week. And it was really hard to do that without a graph of some sort or without quantitative metrics. Another part was motivational strategies. So people had this sense of anticipation with these stories. How would the narratives unfold over time? Um, and this was a sort of a, a, a gendered response here. A number of participants mentioned having negative feedback, right? So the polar bear maybe dying or the tree dying throughout the week. M most of our male participants brought this up. Uh, this still would need to be sort of studied to see how effective it would be. And I wanted to see the final stage I could get to. So what was interesting is, even though we kind of designed this as a real life game, uh, we never used game-like language or, or nomenclature when we were talking to our participants. And this is important because the game sort of emerged from the participants themselves. So they saw it as a game. And as a result of that, um, there was some kind of critical issues. Like, I don't like incentives for getting points artificially by taking unnecessary trips. So you could game the system simply by walking a lot, not necessarily using walking to replace another kind of transit, which is what we were trying to support. Another part that came out is, if I didn't get a leaf or a flower after, I felt like I was getting cheated out of my points. So the inference system wasn't perfect, and sometimes it would sort of infer the wrong behavior, and then people felt cheated. So those are two interesting findings, I think, that have implications for the rest of my work and the work like this. So that was UB Green. It's the first system to semi-automatically combine sensing and feedback on the mobile phone for transit behaviors. And it had a number of findings that I've then folded back into this eco-feedback design space and used to build my own systems, which I'm going to talk about next. So this is a bit of a transition now. I want you to go from thinking about tr transport or, tr or uh, transportation to home resource consumption. So in here, our primary focus was inputs and actionability. If you think about those mobile phone displays, another missing thing was how actionable is the information? You know, maybe a more actionable representation of information would actually be telling you a recommendation about a different kinds of travel mode, like a bus, that would be more efficient. Right? So it didn't make any recommendations. So it didn't have real actionable information in the mobile phone display. So how can we do something that's more actionable? So what are the most water consuming activities in the home? I just thought I would open that up since we're kind of transitioning here. Let's see if we can come up with the top three. Toilet. What was it? Toilet. Toilet. Shower. 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 Laundry. Dishwasher. Lawn. Lawn. Well, say indoors, but lawn is about 40%. So irrigation, outdoors is about 40%, 50% in Seattle. Probably because we really want to save up all our water until, until the summer and we and we go outdoors and just use it. So, so I think we had dishwasher, laundry, uh, laundry and shower, or toilet. So we did pretty well. Dishwasher is down here. Um, but I think it's interesting. You know, It's difficult for audiences to respond to this question, despite the fact that I imagine all of us showered today. You know, we've all been sort of relying on modern infrastructure our whole lives. And it's difficult for us to, to, to answer this question. And I think part of that is there's just no good way to get information about it. So I like to use this analogy. Let's imagine that we're going grocery shopping, but there's no price labels on anything, right? So we're just going grocery shopping. We're filling up our cart. We're estimating the cost of the produce and the meat that we have. And then when we get through the checkout, we don't actually get a nice itemized receipt from Safeway like you ordinarily do. But instead, you have to wait one month, right? And you get this kind of receipt, which is, says, look, total food units, 1527 total price, $642. That would fundamentally change the kind of transactions that occur in stores. But yet, this is the same level of data that we basically get about resource consumption in the home, right? So what if you could get the same level of feedback in the home? And that's really the vision that we've, uh, that we've pointed to for this work that I'm going to be presenting next. So I've looked at electricity, gas, and water. But the primary focus of my dissertation is on water. So that's what I'll be talking about. So the vision is, let's give people itemized feedback about where water consumption is going in their home. So this would be like in the kitchen. This is in the bath. And it's not just down to the fixture level. It would also, this is Scott's home, by the way. Scott's beautiful in their home. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. But it, so it's not just at the fixture level, but really we want it all the way down to be able to discriminate hot and cold. Because there's actually an interesting relationship between energy and water consumption. You use about 15% of your energy in your home just heating water. So we want to give people an itemized breakdown of hot and cold if we can. 
Okay, so unlike a traditional water me meter, which is like a turbine-based meter where you actually have to cut into the pipes to sense or monitor how much water is being consumed, we wanted to do something that was much more non-invasive. And remember also, a traditional water meter just gives you one number, and we want to disaggregate that number down to the fixture or valve level. Okay, so we came up with a way of doing this through single point sensing, just using pressure. So you screw on the sensor to any kind of um, access point. Here you have an existing water spigot, a 3 4 inch spigot. And then it identifies water usage activity down to the individual fixture and it provides estimates of flow. So to sort of understand how this works, I thought uh, I would give you a short plumbing primer. Uh, this is probably the second cheesiest slide of my deck, so enjoy that. Um, <clears throat> So most of us get public utility water, I would imagine. How many people are on public utility water versus how many people are on well water? Nobody. Interesting, well water, if you're on well water, you usually don't have a very good idea because you're not metered. Uh, the only way you know how much you're consuming is by how often you have to you know, get rid of your, the stuff in your septic tank. So um, anyway, we get, we get water from the public utility, which pressurizes it. Um, pressure is important because we have a pressure-based sensing approach. So this pressure regulator, which is usually mandated by cities or states, um, stabilizes the incoming pressure and protects your pipes from high-level or uh, supply-level uh, uh, spikes, pressure spikes. And this is kind of a canonical plumbing layout. And the key here is that it's a closed pressure system. And, and by that, I mean, you know, when you open up a valve, you get instant access to water. Right? You don't have to wait for the water to propagate throughout your plumbing system. And that's good, because it's a good conduit for our signal. And the second thing is that the hot water heater actually bridges between the hot water line and the cold water line. So they're actually under the same closed pressure system. Again, that's good, because we only want to use one sensor. So let's, take, let's give you an example. Here we're going to put HydroSense on this hose spigot. And we're going to flush the toilet. And when you open up that valve, you flush the toilet, it creates this kind of disruption in what was in equilibrium in this closed pressure system, and it creates this pressure wave. Now let's uh, open up the kitchen sink, cold open valve. So you can actually see, right, visually, that these, two, uh, that these two fixtures create two different kinds of pressure waves. And now let's open the kitchen sink hot. And the signal actually travels through the hot water heater, so, this, so the high frequency part is more dampened. So we can actually use the fact that it's going through the hot water heater to discriminate between hot water usage and cold water usage. And I actually lied. It's, I simplify things a little bit. It actually turns out when you open up a valve, the signal goes everywhere. And that's what enables a single sensing approach. So we can actually, yep. Wait, can you distinguish between two things running in parallel? So that's a, so the, the question, Ron's question is about what happens if, you know, someone flushes the toilet and someone else uses the kitchen sink or someone's showering and then flushes the toilet, a compound event. I'll get into that in a second. So that's a good question. So, um, so because the signal goes everywhere, we've actually evaluated HydroSense at a variety of different kind of um, access points. So here's one on the host bigot, the hot water heater, and then inside, these are 3 8 inch connections, this is below bathroom sink or a kitchen sink. And these are great for, for apartments versus here for, for houses. So let's take a look at the signal in more detail. Um, there's this sort of dampened sinusoidal waveform part, both for the open as well as for the close. And then the third part of the signal that's of interest here is this delta, this pressure delta. And that basically allows us to get an estimate of flow, so flow rate. So greater delta, more flow rate. I think I have a quick movie. So this is going to play at, I think, 2x. And then it's going to quickly go to 8x. So it's a very fast movie of me using water in someone's home. But hopefully you could see the pressure signals here as I'm uh, activating and deactivating fixtures. Real time. <laughs> so the important point here is just seeing the variety of signals. This, by the way, is just an overview of what's showing down here. The variety of signals that exist in someone's home. Can you disambiguate when you're going through bathroom versus kitchen? Can you disambiguate location? No. Or you're location saying, in the house? You're very specific here, right? You see bathroom sink uh -huh. and uh, right. versus, let's say, kitchen sink. Yeah, so there's three levels which I'll kind of get into. So you can imagine a system that with the highest fidelity would be telling you how much water you're using at the individual valve. So that'd be valve level detail. Then you could go up one level from that and just say, okay, I don't care about temperature. I just want to know which fixture is being used, okay? And then you can, so that would be like upstairs bathroom sink versus downstairs bathroom sink. So that's fixture level. And then you can imagine going to fixture category level, which is just sink, a sink is being activated. And for each of those levels, there's different kinds of policy and sort of, I mean, different kinds of stakeholders. P people who have different interests at those different levels. And I'll get into this uh, in my future work as well. I 
Right. Could you distinguish the toilet upstairs versus the one downstairs? That's right. So that would be fixture level. So that's sort of the medium grade. The one level be, uh, above that would be valve level, which would be saying, you know, in, this, in the toilet case, it only uses cold water, right? So this is an easy example, but it with, would be like bathroom sink hot, right? Versus bathroom sink cold. Yep. Uh, can you distinguish between the two different ways that valves operate? Closed, fast, or slow? Or so that's a question which I'll get into in the, the second study that we have. And if I don't answer it, then you can bring it up again. Yep. I'm, uh, I'm trying to like, remember, uh, Actually, I've had this thing called green something. Uh, what is it called? Uh, anyway, the, the, what they've done was is they, um, we were looking at energy, right? And similar sort of modeling had to happen, which is sort of like the, the whole idea was at the end of the day, our you know, one team would provide some analysis to the user and saying, here's where your energy is being used. And for example, you're using you know, your wash and heat or whatever. And they did a lot of modeling based, based on, on similar things. Right? But, um, it was very approximate. It didn't actually capture because what they were doing was sort of similar things to, to I think, what you're saying they would actually look at the electric uh, uh, signature mm -hmm. and, and determine and sort of have the user go and say, hey, I use the following, and then from there they would create a model and then right. the model and do this. So it's, in general, it's a similar approach. We have a calibrated model right now, and I talk a little bit in, in future work about... My advisor, Schwedek, is really known well for doing electricity disaggregation over sort of voltage noise yeah. that's kind of modulated onto the yeah. power line. Yeah. Um, that might be similar. I mean, George Hart had the original work that I'm familiar with, electricity yeah. disaggregation work, but anyway, okay. in the 1980s. Okay. Thank you, at home. What was it? Are you oh, home? Are you oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He went over that in the early part of the summer. Sorry, so that's actually very coarse. They didn't do any disaggregation. And if they did, they were only looking at load profiles. They actually, uh, well, they're people but they actually, uh, you know, if the user went and actually said, this is what I did, and they, they included that into the model, and then eventually when they would see the signature, they would back trace the back model. So it was, that's why it was so. The, the hard part about that is you have so many things in your home, like all, like all lights. So if, the, if they're working with the data I think they're working with, which I think they're just looking at load profiles, all lights basically look the same. So it's, it's hard for them. Or, and there's a lot of different kind of things. Like your laptop charger might look similar to other kind of chargers you have in your house. So it kind of depends on the, on the model that they're using. But in general, the approach is right. So Victor is talking about using a trained model, which is what we do. This is kind of the point of this slide, in fact. So right, I've demonstrated that these different fixtures have different signals, right? And that allows us to identify where water is occurring in the home, and that's because the signature is dependent on the fixture type, the valve type, but also the propagation pathway. So that the plumbing system itself basically is a transfer function on the signal. Okay, that's good because it allows us to. It's highly discriminable, but it's sort of bad if you think about it in terms of cross generaliz generalizable models across homes. Right. So right now we're working with per trained or per home trained calibration data. So um, let me just look, uh, give you a, a better example of kind of how the uh, the algorithm performs or, or works. So the there's kind of four parts here. Detect that a water event has occurred, because for the most part it's flat. It's just a flat, flat pressure line. So we want to detect that a water event has occurred. We want to classify the event as open or close, and then determine the source of that event, towel, toilet, shower, and then provide estimates of flow. So let's take a look at this as sort of the, water, uh, the pressure is coming in. We use this raw pressure signal. We actually just do some um, a low pass filter, and then we use a derivative filter. And this derivative signal, we're basically looking for these changes, right? We want to look at changes in the signal so we can segment the event. So the signal's coming in here. We're looking for these drastic kind of critical changes in pressure. So this gives us an idea that there's maybe something happening. Then we look for a stabilization point, and then we can segment again. So now we know that there's something that's happening, right? So automatically detected event, but we don't know if it's an open or a close. So to get that categorical data, we actually look at two things, a pressure decrease and then a negative initial derivative. And if that's the case, like it is here, then we know that it's an open event. And we basically do the same thing for a close. Right? So now, though, we're going to get this pressure increase and then a uh, positive initial derivative. So now we have this close. Now, now we have open and close, but we don't know which fixtures are responsible for that water usage. So let's take a quick look at that. So we have this unclassified open event, and as kind of Victor alluded to, we use a template matching approach. So we have to have an existing library of templates in which to do our comparison, which means that we have to do calibration, which is kind of a, a challenge. And I'll get into that in, in future work. So does this work? Okay, so the first study was basically looking at the feasibility of using pressure to do disaggregation. And our approach here was controlled experimental trials in 10 homes. We'd have two people go into homes and just uh, basically open up and close valves. 
and then we'd mark that uh, ground truth data on these laptops. We do that manual annotation. Um, and we also collected flow data. In four of the 10 homes, we also did flow data calibration studies using a uh, calibrated bucket, which is basically the plumbing standard, if you will. Um, and then with the 10 test sites, we had 706 trials, 155 flow trials, and 84 total fixtures were tested. So for our classification experiments, we did tenfold cross-validation. Here the x-axis is the homes, and the y-axis is classification accuracy, so higher is better. Um, uh, blue is open events, and green is closed events. So here, yeah, we did pretty well. In fact, in some houses we had 100%. If you look at this in aggregate, 99% for opens and 97% with closes. So we we're pretty satisfied with this. You can look at the data in another way. I'm going to change the x-axis. It's the same data by looking at it in terms of fixture category. And here we did pretty well again. Shower closes were, were uh, the least uh, accurate. And that's because there's different ways of closing your shower, actually, with the, the diverter valve that you have, depending on the shower. So that, that one is actually a more complicated example. <clears throat> So in terms of flow inference, we were basically looking for 10% error margins because we found in empirical studies of traditional meters, that's basically what they perform at. So anything above 90% is usually pretty good. And of course, this is just basically a feasibility study, so we only did four homes, but you get uh, above 90% accuracies there as well. Yep? What about the, the long-term temporal signature? I would think a shower would be one of the ones that you could look at at the state. That's, yeah, that's definitely true. Actually, quite a bit more. That's very yeah, true. In fact, uh, and in fact, we didn't capture that at all because we basically did the same exact uh, amount of time per trial for each fixture here. So we didn't. On the onset of the state? Or, well, or since these were controlled trials, we would just go in and use your shower and we keep the valve open for five seconds. We didn't sort of naturalistically use your shower. The onset, the leading edge, or the trailing edge, or both? Um, Turn the valve on. Oh, right. So, so basically how long that, that high-frequency waveform? Uh, you were doing template matching. Were you doing template matching on the leading edge or the trailing edge or both? Uh, we're doing it, well, we're basically doing match filtering. On the, the onset of the state, when you first turn the valve on? Yes. Or what about when you turn it off, also? I don't think we looked at that. Um, I had a comment. If you go yeah. back to the slide before this week, like, uh, so in each of these cases, for example, if you take a dishwasher or, a, or a, you know, whatever, uh, not, not a bathtub and shower, but definitely toilets, so there's a capacity, there's a volume of water that is used every time, right? You right. fill it up. And these vendors could potentially, or you could even just have the capacity for different vendors already there. So then you wouldn't have to necessarily look at just the signature of up and down. You could actually look at the volume rate. Right, so that's something I'll get into as well. So I think there's a, a number of things actually that we're not capturing. So that's what I thought, I think it's Mike was alluding to in terms of temporal aspects of, uh, you know, a shower is going to be 10 to 12 minutes versus a toilet's going to be 45 to 55 seconds. So there's a lot of information that we're not capturing by doing this really simplistic template matching approach. And I'll get into that uh, and again later in the talk. I mean, you were very controlled on your sinks, right? You That's opened true. them all the way. So that kind of gets toward, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but that gets towards his question, which was, for them, I mean, we didn't actually control for it so much. I had undergrads and, and myself, I was involved. I mean, we just open up the valve and then close it. We weren't really thinking too much about how fast we were opening it and how it closed, but we were still wondering about that, that question, so, and we, which I'm going to get into in just a second here. So, uh, questions? Good. Okay, so... Uh, you know, the, the results of these trials, you know, demonstrated to us that this is actually a fairly feasible technique and more experiment experimentation is necessary to kind of get at the other questions that we've had about um, compound events, so more than one thing happening at a time, or how about, you know, changes the way that people use different kind, kinds of fixtures. So that's kind of what we we're interested in, so right, so like brushing your teeth or shaving or bathing or even paw washing, right, cheesiest slide in my deck here. <laughs> Interestingly, when I actually show this to people after my talk, the people are like, I'm so glad you showed that because, you know, I have a cat and they use water in the home and I just don't know what to do about it. I'm like, oh, interesting. <laughs> so, or the worst case, what happens if all these things are happening at the same time, right? Your cat decides to use the water while you're brushing your teeth and, and, and bathing. So uh, those are the kinds of things that we were interested in studying in the second study here where we wanted to see how well HydroSense can classify real-world water usage. That's what we care about, right? So we did a five-week deployment in five homes to study this. 
And so, you know, originally we were doing this manual annotation of all the water activity in people's homes, but we can't do that, right? You don't want me following you around like Desney and his wife and his kids every time they're using water in the home. So we're not going to have like an undergrad we could probably pay to do it, but it just wouldn't work out very well. So this isn't going to work. So this whole study became about how do we get ground truth labels, okay, on the water usage activities in the home. And at first, we, and I'm not going to have a chance to go through all these uh, different ways that we tried, but if you get me on a one-on-one, -on -one, we can talk about it. So we've just thought, okay, we'll use these X10 buttons. We'll have people tell us whenever they're using water. It turns out, and I have a whole bunch of time-lapse videos showing how poorly this performs, but I'll just tell you that people aren't good about providing ground truth labels on their water usage. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's, a, it's a good movie. So in other words, we had to do an automated method. We wanted something where people weren't even you know, in the loop, basically. So here, the most important part in terms of hardware capabilities is something that's water resistant, right? Because we're dealing with water. And in terms of sensing capabilities, we wanted it to work across fixtures and appliances, detect opens and closes, and here discriminate hot, cold, and mixed. And these are discrete states, okay? So hot, cold, and mixed. Um, but if you think about it, we wanted, this is actually a hard problem, right? There's a lot of different kinds of fixtures, manual operated, but also these electromechanical devices, right? Your appliances, they use water in different ways. They require different ways of getting ground truth data on that water usage. But let's say we were focused just on the manually operated valves. Here, the single handle faucet is much different from the dual handle faucet. So there's a lot of different kind of fixture designs which require, have different kind of specifications for how water is being measured at each of these fixtures, right? So after many failed attempts, we actually ended up doing our own custom ground truth sensor board. In fact, Gabe Cohn, who's entered here, did this PCB for us. We use Zigbee, and here we're doing a distributed sensor network. We're going to basically affix a sensor to every single valve that you have in your house, and it's going to provide ground truth labels on our pressure stream. These three are the value-oriented sensors. So a Hall effect sensor, a reed switch, three-axis accelerometer, and then these two are vibration sensors. They wake up the sensor board and send us the data. So we had a low amount of transmissions usually in the home because there usually wasn't that, all that much data and we also could keep our bat, uh, power levels at a minimum. Okay? In addition, we also had the kilowatt, a modified kilowatt to analyze when power was being drawn from these appliances, which we would then correlate with uh, water usage as well. So those are the different ways that we got the ground truth data. This is my bathroom sink. That's a reed switch, that's a magnet. So this is, in, in this case, it's a binary. Uh, you know, binary data. Um, this is uh, my advisor's kitchen. So this is an accelerometer. That's what would tell us the position of a single handle faucet. Um, this is a bath. This is a toilet. This is my toilet. <laughs> and this is my advisor's shower. And I think it's important. It took us about a team of three to four people, two or three days to do each one of these houses. And it's important when the spouse maybe comes home and sees this, that, you know, you have a joke ready. So the one I told uh, Julie, in this case, was, you know, when you get in the shower, just be sure you don't touch the wires because you're going to get a little bit of a shock. <laughs> so, no, actually, they were very low vo voltage. But anyway, so I don't think Julie showered for like two weeks. Um, <laughs> um, so this is what it looked like for the appliances. Actually, notice we use a thermistor as well, right, so that we could actually look at what the output of the washing machine was so we could discriminate if it was a hot, cold cycle or just a cold, cold cycle and so on, right? So we had that ground truth data as well. Um, remember, all of this, sometimes people get confused. All of this was done just so we'd get ground truth labels on the pressure stream. It's not like HydroSense requires this distributed sensor network, okay? So it's just to get those ground truth labels. And because we went out to all this work, we wanted to do two sensors per home. So we could scientifically basically validate, well, how much of a jump are we going to get if we have a second sensor? So we put one on a cold point, one on a hot point. That's what it looks like in an apartment. Um, and so I just want to play this quick video. We always had a data logger you know, deployed to communicate with the sensor network as well as the pressure stream. So here the blue is the cold line and the red is the hot line and then down here is the ground truth data. So I'll just play a quick movie. So I'm going to flush. The reed switch goes up here. And I'm about to use the cold water. All right, brush the teeth. Um, so for every house, we deploy the sensor network. Yep. Did you consider microphonics? Seems like it would be much less invasive. Yeah, we thought about that. We thought about uh, a whole bunch of ideas. So in terms of using audio signals, is that? Or you could strap it on to the uh, pipes if they're available. Right. So 
underneath, right? So we actually did deployments in apartments, so that would make that kind of hard. But we started out using microphones just to do the disaggregation, actually. So we, we had all of that code written. We could have done it. What we found is that people tend not to ha like to have live mics in their home, especially in, around their bathrooms. Right. So we, we still want to have make sure that we have valve level information, right? So we want to know, so we'd have to you know, de deploy that fairly strategically. Here we could just affix it to the fixture itself. I think maybe that approach would work. It would take you know, some time to think about how you could discriminate between all the different signals, but it, it might work. OK, so in addition to the, the sensor network, we had the data logger and then the two pressure sensors. Um, we also had a Hydra server where all the data was being communicated to our web server, where it would also notify us if a sensor went down, because if you've done deployments, you know how expensive that can be in terms of time. We didn't want to waste any data. And then we also built a whole bunch of uh, analysis code through visualization and through MATLAB okay, to deal with all the incoming data. So in total, uh, two apartments, three houses, 103 water valves were instrumented in 15,000 water events. And what's interesting here is that there isn't that much data out there at this level about water usage in the home. So it's interesting just to look at it descriptively. Well, how many times do water, valves act, water valve av activations occur? And so here you're seeing that average event count per day. And you see this kind of jump here in home three. And that's because they have four occupants. Okay, the rest of the houses have two occupants. Okay, so it's about 35 to 46 events per day overall. But what's more interesting than this is how much of that had a hot water component? Well, actually, a startling amount, we thought, 60%. In fact, 75% here in apartment one. Remember, I mentioned that kind of interesting nexus between energy and water consumption. In terms of where water is going, this is by event frequency down to the fixture level. You'll see it's kind of uh, basically a power law distribution. And 85% are just the first four kinds of fixtures. M kitchen sink, master bathroom sink, master bathroom toilet, and secondary bathroom sink. Okay. Now, how about compound events? What's interesting here is that there was no data that in which we could have built a model on before we ran this kind of study about how often compound events occur because nobody had done this kind of study before. So what do you guys think in terms of how often do compound events occur in the home? And I think the question is dependent on two things. One is how many people are in the home and how often are they in the home together? But let's just see. Is it, is it 80%? Is it 10%? So I guess in the morning there will be more compound events. <laughs> That's true. So it actually has this temporal component, right? So in our data set, it was about 22%, right? Nearly a fourth, which we thought was actually a lot. Um, but it, can you think about why this might be? Why, right, why, why is this, this? What's the most common compound? Both hot and cold. That happens. That's true. What's the most common, common fixture compound event? <laughs> Flushing <laughs> and hopefully washing your hands, which we have data on for everybody, including my advisors. So about 42%, okay, of all bathroom sinks were in compound because of, of flushing toilets. So because they are so frequent, I thought I'd go through this really quickly. Uh, yep. Sorry, so you didn't find that the shower consumes most of the water? So this was by event frequency. Oh, by event frequency. Yes. Yeah, so if you remember, we, we yeah, yeah, yeah. basically discretized our, our state space, yeah. Um, I don't think I'm going to have, well, I'll, I'll get through this and maybe skip another part of, of my work because I think this is interesting. So in terms of how these signals sort of look, again, the y-axis is uh, P PSI. Um, so this is a bathroom sink in isolation. This is a bathroom sink event with the toilet open. So you'll notice there's a couple of things. One is it's slightly distorted, right? It's dampened. And that's because there's water filling in the pipes. But what's interesting is the sort of frequency component is actually relatively stable. And the other thing that's interesting is you just look at it temporally, which is what I thought you were getting at before. This is about two and a half seconds of use. And this example is drawn from our actual ground truth data set. In other words, if you see something that's a couple of seconds long, it's much more likely to be a sink activity. Right? And we weren't actually using that kind of data. Um, so here's another signal. So we kind of thought, how can we move beyond just template matching? How can we capture a lot of these other signals? So duration of water activity, time of day, which is kind of what came out there, uh, recency of use, number of uses, the overall pressure drop, and really importantly, the relationship between valve events. Right? We know toilets in bathroom sink water activity is, is related in some way, so how can we capture that? And we brainstormed, we finally arrived at a more Bayesian approach, and here, we deal with the same pressure signature library, but now we have a sequence of an unknown pressure transient, not just one. So we have a sequence. We have this most likely valve sequence. That's what we're basically trying to solve for. We have the conditional probability term. And this is the match filtering and also uses some simple signal features like stabilized pressure drop. But for our prior probability terms, we have things like biograms. right? So what's the relationship between fixture activities? 
so the toilet flushing and the water and the bathroom sink. Um, and then f we also had a grammar. So if you see an open, you're much more likely to see a close. And this also gives us the, the ability to match things. So we want to be able to match things so that we can actually get things at like water usage, duration, and volume, which is also critically important, right? So in terms of classification, um, overall at the valve level was 75.5%. So this is the same kind of classification that we did f before when I was showing you nearly the 100% classification accuracy. So as it turns out, real world water data is much more, it's much harder to classify. So we get this big drop here, but as I already mentioned, we can go up one level from that to fixture level. So this is upstairs bathroom sink, downstairs bathroom sink, kitchen sink at the fixture level, and we get a jump here to 89.5%. We can also go to fixture category level, okay, so which is just saying sink. And then we get another jump to 96%. So it kind of depends on what applications you want to build around this, this sensor. And then in terms of two pressure sensors, we get a marginal but significant increase. So it just sort of depends on what your investment is in trying to get, get access to this data in terms of how many sensors you might deploy. So that was for our second study, which I think demonstrated that HydroSense is capable of basically discriminating water events uh, real-world water, water events, especially at the fixture category level. And as we went through and evaluated this, we collected one of the most comprehensive data sets of water usage in the world. Okay? So I want to quickly go over this next step, which is what should we do with this water? And that's really what I've been working on the last five months, which is this display called Reflect. And here there's a number of different areas that I pulled on from this eco-feedback design space. I'm not going to have time to talk about this in great detail, but the key that going from that mobile phone display to something that we're placing in people's homes, there's a number of differences. One is it's a shared display now. It's not just a personal display. And there's also a number of different kinds of occupants in the home, right? So there's kids and there's different family members, and they all have different ideas about what the data should look like potentially and how, how that should kind of promote different kinds of activities. So one of the things that we concentrated on is the aesthetics of the device. We want people to bring this into their home and this kind of pulling upon Beth Minot's work and putting a, uh, a frame around the display. So it's not just this you know, piece of computational technology that it actually looks like a, a piece that you would actually put into your kitchen. Okay? And this is one of the, the interfaces. The interface overall looks like this is broken down into two things. At the top you have this status bar and at the bottom you have this rotating ambient display of different kinds of water depictions, water visualizations. At this top part it has this news feed, weather, aggregate water usage, and the date and time. And I basically like to use this kind of analogy or story about, you know, when you walk into your kitchen, why do you look at your microwave? It's just an appliance. Because it has a clock. Right, so that's the same kind of attention that I'm hoping to pull in here with this. And that's why I have a number of other things at the top of this that's not just related to consumption. So and I'm also rotating you know, every three to five minutes different depictions of the data. So this is a much more um, you know, pragmatic representation of water usage. So let's look at one of these called rain flow. Basically these flows coming out of the different fixture categories is dependent on the recency of use. And then I also show people their daily average and their goal in these, uh, basically what are bar graphs, but they're cylinders, which is kind of capturing the flow as it's coming out. So I'm gonna load up a video if it actually loads um, <clears throat> to give you an idea of what this looks like. So this is what it looks like. <clears throat> so you'll notice this is gonna get slimmer right now. So, and that's dependent on the recency of use, and then I'm gonna control for the amount of cylinders. So all these things would change depending on the dependency, and then it's a highly interactive. So this is a touch screen, so people can you know, run their fingers along the display, and all of the displays are sort of interactive in this way, all the displays that I've built. So, you know, to, to contrast that one, which is a bit more abstract, we have this time series view where the y-axis is flow rate and x-axis is time. Right? Again, this is much more of a pragmatic representation. And then perhaps the most abstract or artistic is this aquatic ecosystem, which is similar to what we did for UB Green. And here we think it might appeal more to kids. And this is really about kind of water as a game in the home. So you start with Frank the fish, and then there's different kind of water savings goals. And if you meet one of those goals, different things will happen in a scene. So Frank might meet a mate and the, they might actually have kids. And basically this ecosystem is evolving as people are using water and meeting their different water saving ta uh, targets. So this might be what, uh, what the end of you know, a couple of weeks would look like. 
So uh, in terms of evaluation, um, we're going to do two parts here. We're currently doing this, which is an in-lab study. Where we're actually bringing people in and we're looking at objective measures about comprehensibility. So do people comprehend the displays and how quickly does it take them to answer uh, questions about what they're seeing in the displays. But we're also very interested in doing a field deployment which will link HydroSense along with these reflect displays and then deploy these doing another kind of qualitative deployment just to see what people feel like when they're, they're seeing these visualizations in their home. So in summary, there's really four big contributions here. The first is this eco-feedback design space that allows designers and people who are interested in building these systems think critically about the systems that they're building and the kind of trade-offs that exist there. And I also built, two, built and evaluated two systems. So UB Green for personal transit uh, um, patterns and uh, HydroSense, which provides the highest granularity of any water monitoring system that exists right now. And then also Reflect, which takes this data and presents it to people in order to promote water efficient behaviors in the home. So how much more time do I have? So we started a little late. OK. OK. So I just want to briefly touch on before I go into future work, just that there's a number of other areas, some of which I collaborated with people in this room on, a number of other projects that I've worked on in grad school that didn't really uh, make it part of my core uh, dissertation, so I didn't put in my job talk. Um, I worked on like visualization systems for source code repositories for software engineers, all the way to these mobile tools to support field studies. Um, and this is perhaps what I'm most known for, um, so I thought I would just go into this a little bit. So my experience allows people to do field studies and it combines sensing or objective data. So this might be physiological monitoring about heart rate or it might be activity monitoring along with um, self-report and it does that through this sensing triggers and actions framework. So it's a very easy lightweight way of linking all of these things on the mobile phone and allowing people to do field studies that ties together physiological metrics with self-report metrics. Let me give you a quick example. So here we notice that you just finished your morning walk. How is your breathing rate? Here we have three sensors, a location sensor, a heart rate sensor, and a human activity sensor. Okay? So this is this XML scripting interface, the XML part is kind of a, a, a more precise or allows you to really depict this stuff through a lightweight mechanism, but we also have a scripting interface which allows you to do things more dynamically, so tying behaviors together. So this action now, we want to just ask this one survey. We notice that you just finished your morning walk. How is your breathing rate? And we're going to tie this stuff together through a trigger. And this is where the scripting mechanism comes in. So here you notice that we get the sensor, this human activity sensor. We see if it just exited the walking state and that they were in the state for 15 minutes. And if they were, then we just ask them the self-report survey. And this is important because we can get quantitative sensor data about heart rate, but we can't get uh, information about subjective feelings of exhaustion, right? We need to have a person actually give us responses about that. Okay, so since 2007, there's been 95,000 website visits, 3,000 downloads, 124 cit citations, and what I'm most proud of is the dozens of studies that this has enabled really across the world, and these studies have had a social sort of component, which is a big part of my work as well. So people have used it to do heart health and stress studies or preterm infants. This was at UC Irvine. There's also a, a researcher in Australia who's using it for smoking cessation. So that's really meaningful to me and, and uh, basically means that my time was well spent in trying to open source this. So now in terms of future work, I'm just going to go through three areas, eco-feedback, urban informatics, and new hydrosense applications. <clears throat> so in terms of eco-feedback, there's three, uh, three things, longitudinal deployment of hydrosense and reflect. So in graduate school, I've been unable to do a longitudinal de deployment to really b assess some of the behavioral uh, changes that people might have. So I'd really be interested in doing that. And a lot of times when I give this talk, people are really interested in the ethics of persuasion. So what does it mean if we slightly manipulate the data? It could even just be shifting the y-axis a little bit on a graph would result in very different kinds of behaviors. So as a designer, what does it mean when we have that kind of influence and power? So there's some interesting ethical implications. And then finally, applications of eco-feedback to health behavior. So I can get more into this in my one-on-ones as well. But that's basically where I started on the UBFIT project, is looking at technology and promoting healthier behaviors. So in terms of urban informatics, sometimes people call this smart city research. I'm really keenly interested in the digitalization of infrastructure. So the smart grid or uh, traffic sensors and all this information. In fact, it looks like their parking garage at 90, building 99 also has some kind of sensing. I don't know if it works or not about full 
Okay. No, it doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> but it's those kind of sensors that I'm interested in. So I looked at this in a number of ways, and I don't really have too much time to get into it, but this was through shared bicycling. So as it turns out, uh, you know, cities like Paris and Barcelona, even London now have this sh these shared bicycling systems, and these are third-generation systems. And by third-generation, I mean they're, they're digitalized. So you actually have a, a smart like RFID card that you slide, and when you slide, it creates this digital transi transaction that we can sniff. Right, this little digital footprint of where people are in the city, and then it gives them access to, this, to these bikes. So it's that digital transaction that I'm interested in, because we can scrape that and use it to do interesting things about you know, where people are in the city. For example, here we just basically looked at where the most active stations were. Right? So this is a lightweight way of getting a sense of the city in real time, or you know, when the most active times of the day are. So you can actually just see from uh, shared bicycling the morning commute, late Spanish launch, so this is 2 p.m., not 12 p.m. as you'd expect it to be, and then the evening commute. And what's interesting is what happens if we combine shared bicycling with bus data, like the Orca car data, or the subway, right? So we started doing this as well. So we have the London, uh, uh, let's see, Oyster card, I think it's called, the, the London Underground data, data set. And interestingly here, we did that same time series analysis. You only see two spike patterns. Right? So this either reflects a difference in the ways that people are appropriating you know, shared bicycling versus the underground, or it's a difference in culture in the cities, the London versus Barcelona. So there's a lot of interesting questions about this, like how should this real-time information be visualized, where should it be stored, how should it be accessed, you know, can we use this to automatically determine anomalies in the city. And then finally, hydrosense app, new hydrosense applications. So the first one would be leaks. Even in our ground truth data set, we actually saw this a little bit. Uh, in particular, we saw it through toilets, which account for 30% of residential leaks. So the leaky flapper valve that you're supposed to replace every four to five years, as I'm sure you do. So we actually were able to see this in our, in our ground truth. So can we automatically detect that? And I think that's an interesting question. What about the kind of behavioral patterns that water activity reflects, okay? So just by looking at these water routines in three homes, we can see when people are going to work, when they're doing things in their kitchen, right, when they're going for their bedtime routine, but how predictable are the behaviors, right? And the predictability of this stuff speaks directly to applications like aging in place. So imagine using HydroSense just to give you an alert, it's 9 a.m., your grandmother hasn't actually used the kitchen sink or hasn't used the bathroom as she usually does, or a different kind of system would be, you know, there's a link between dementia and water usage. So people who are struggling with some cognitive impairments might forget to flush the toilet, they might change their bathing practices, and some of that can come out through just simply looking at water practices. Yep? I'm kind of surprised you could sense a leak. Uh, a big leak, yes. Uh, a drip, 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 drip over 24-7 would be a, still a, a big water consumer, but I'm, I'm kind of surprised you said you could sense it the way you do. So we can't sense anything that drips, because it's not going to create a pressure sensor, a uh, pr pressure signal. A leaky flapper valve is going to, though. We need anything that is basically going to create a signature on the pressure line. So a leak, uh, something that is just leaking out of your tap, isn't going to create any sort of disruption in the, in the, in the, in the closed pressure system. No, it is a leak, but that's not something that we can sense automatically with HydroSense. You're going to have to use some other technique. So that's a good question. Um, privacy implications. So yes, water activity reflects, because it's a fundamental ingredient of life, it reflects different kinds of activities in the home. So there's privacy implications here as well. So imagine that you, know, you come home and you see this display. It's 6 p.m. and you know you have a 12-year-old son. And wait, what's this? A little water activity around noon or 1 p.m., right? They were supposed to be at school. And it's only because of the way that we visualize the data, right? Through the, the, the fish display wouldn't reveal this kind of thing. So as you, you know, think about this new sensing technology and feedback technology, it can reveal different kinds of patterns about our lives that we may not want to be revealed. Okay. And then finally, uh, and we touched on this a little bit in terms of how can we train up HydroSense quickly? So how, what kind of training set do we need? Um, how quickly can we train it up? Can we do an unsupervised or a semi-supervised learning approach? And a part of this will actually be this generalizable model that'll be, have some heuristic information about, oh, well, we know showers are 10 to 12 minutes. We know that bathroom toilets are 45 to 70 seconds. All that kind of information we haven't really captured yet and tested to see if it's generalizable. So in, in, uh, in closing, I just want to present a vision, which is we've kind of evolved over time to have different senses of ourself. And we can even get objective senses of ourselves from looking at digital photographs of us or through mirrors. Right? We can get a different sense of ourself. But technology presents this unique opportunity to collect all sorts of information on our eating habits, 
our fitness levels, or even environmental activities. And then we can use technology to feed this kind of information back to us to make us better people or make the environment better, you know, to lead healthier lifestyles. So that's, that's my talk. I want to point out that James Lande and Shwedek Patel are my, my two advisors. And I've worked with a number of collaborators, including some people in this room. And thank you. Yeah. I'm wondering, you know, with the do it up, uh, previous displays, yeah. why haven't those taken off beyond the previous? That's, I think that's a good question. So Ford has an eco uh, display now. Uh, you know, one study that, that I'm really interested in possibly doing would be even just talking to the designers. So how did they come about? How do they think about these displays? Um, the Toyota Prius display really hasn't changed. So I was just riding in the first Toyota Prius model. It's largely, I took pictures of it. It's largely the exact same visualization. So that's kind of, an, you know, an interesting thing. Why haven't they adapted it over time? Was why aren't like a lot of cars that Toyota makes comes with that display if it's sort of such a great right? Vehicle. So so uh, if 20 years ago to track your gas mileage, you had to look at your speedometer. You'd go to the gas station. You'd balance your checkbook. You'd try to figure out what your gas mileage is. Now even if I buy a brand new car, I'm not talking about a hybrid, a regular car. What does it tell you? It tells you what your mileage is, and that allows you. It's actually very empowering information. Wait, the EPA sticker label on this car said it was 24. I'm only getting 18. So either EPA is inaccurate or I'm not driving very well. So I would offer that you're getting a lot more information, you, if you think about it, than, than, you, you, than you were 20 years ago. That there's a, a lot of changes within the car. And the other part is we're keenly aware of the price of gas. Right? Most people right now know that it's over $4. It's blasted at you everywhere. You have a lot of different information sources that you're drawing from for gas. I mean, why, why is it that we just sort of inherently, when we just discuss MPG, you guys, you know, we know what it is, mileage. It's because we have it in normal conversation. We don't usually just talk about our kilowatts per hour. Like, hey, how, how performant is your house? You know, right? We t we, but yet we talk about that with our cars. So it's just an interesting thing. And I think part of it is access to that kind of information, which we will get. We're going towards that. Yeah. Access to information, or is it the cost? I mean, it costs seven cents, eight cents. Right? It's it, oh, right. Uh, I think I think there's a couple of components. We're we're all we're all going to change our behavior if if you increase the price of something. So in Seattle, we talked a little bit about the price or or water consumption behaviors change in the summer. We get a forty percent increase in water consumption. Think about the amount. Think about that peak load change in the summer in Seattle and what that, what that means for the infrastructure. So what do they do from a utility standpoint? They jack up the price of water. So you're, we're in a tiered pricing, you probably don't know this, but we're in a tiered pricing, at least in the city of Seattle. So, so your summer water, if you go over a certain uh, amount, and that's compared to what you usually uh, use during the winter, so that's how they figure it out, then you go up into a larger uh, price point. And that actually changes. So they study, in fact, our urban planning department gets access to all that data and they've shown that it does change behavior, you know, a couple of percentage points depending on demographics. So price fundamentally does change. For water, it's an interesting one because you can only change the price point so much. It's an ethical issue, right? Everyone deserves access to water. So the city of Albuquerque, the last ye five years, each year they've increased the price of water by 8.5%. They can't continue that, right? They're out of fresh water sources. So they're looking for alternative ways of driving down demand. Yep. Question. So the first is like the, the eco feedback design space looks too complicated to me. Like there's too much to consider there. Is it just like the current lack of understanding, or do you have a sense of what are the two biggest things I need to be careful of if I design oh. something? Like right. That? Um, so yeah, so we haven't actually deployed it out and worked with designers to see how they'll you know acquire and, and use this in their in their designs. So that that's one thing that I'm really interested in doing. Um, in terms of what I think is most important, part of that draws on um, psychology literature. So the temporal component, having quick access to that information, which is what I think the mobile phone really affords, is important, right? So when you're at a decision point or when you, the, the mobile phone, since it's always with you, offers that kind of thing. The other is spatial co-location. So giving it while you're engaged in the activity. So there's this temporal connection and this spatial connection to the activity. Those two things I think are most important. Right? So if you walk into a restaurant and I present you with the information as you're making a choice about the menu, it depends on what that information might be. I think calories is actually a bad part because people don't actually know what a calorie is. But that, you know, that could change your choice of what you choose on the menu. Right? And it does. There's been a lot of studies. Just by putting a box 
around something on the menu drives up consumption for that particular thing. So there's a lot of subtle things that people do when they even just look at menus and choices about how to change your behavior. And we can take advantage of those same things on our, on our mobile devices or other feedback displays. You mentioned location. So where are you going to put your, your device? So if you remember, the kitchen sink, I think, was like 30% of all activity. So the kitchen is just a very, very highly trafficked place. And I think it's a, it's a great place for an ambient display. So it would be great if it was like on the fridge or something, but we're, we're putting it on kind of kitchen tables and just one yeah. for cost mainly. But yeah. So, so I was thinking about like, uh, so what are the learnings here, right? And one of the dimensions you, you may have covered, I apologize earlier on, but at least the part that I heard you didn't cover was sort of the demographic that you were going after. And, you know, sort of thinking about the United States versus, for example, Europe versus Asia. And I'm sort of thinking, you know, the same sort of metrics you choose to sort of change behaviors are not, it doesn't seem to me that those would be appealing to somebody from a different culture. So, yeah. so the demographic you're going after is probably a dimension. Of Absolutely. Well. So I have a workshop paper actually on, on looking at that. So my advisor's in China right now. So we're looking a lot at different kind of cultural practices around consumption. Japan is an interesting one because it's seen, uh, obviously it's a more social culture, but it's really seen, um, you know, frugality is seen as something um, that should be, you know, a push towards, right? You should be achieving frugality. Whereas in America, we're more about uh, materialism and consumption. So we want to demonstrate our consumption by buying that Hummer. Whereas in the Japanese culture, it's not really about, about that. It'd be basically the opposite. Right. So I, t I totally agree with you. Right. Yep. That's, that's odd because most of the retailers open their you know, biggest fashion stores, you know, high-end fashion stores in Japan. So I don't know why you're saying they're kind of not a part of their culture. I mean, right. <laughs> I, mean I, I think we wouldn't, I think, I, I, mean, I think would, you, would you accept the fact that there are different kinds of cultural components Okay, so th I think that's the major point. We can tease apart different parts if we want, but that's the major point. I, I think Victor's point is, is right, which is there are fundamentally going to be differences. And it kind of goes towards the interface. We have generally just one interface for everybody. Right. Yeah. And it shouldn't be that way. It should be strongly personalized. And that's one difference between paper and technology. It should be personalized to us and so, change so, over time. So I guess that to follow up, so did your research, did you do an iterative process to your research? Yeah, you did. yeah so oftentimes, so I, I pulled that out, but even with UB Green, so a lot of times what we would do, we do online surveys, we would do formative studies where we'd be, bring people in and have them look at different, different visualizations, different kind of renderings of the, of the graphics. Um, we did uh, an in situ study even, where we gave people mobile phones that would actually track where they were in real time and then ask them surveys about what kind of transit mode they took and why. To, to, to try to build and have you know, evidence for the kind of dis display decisions that we we're making.